नमस्कार एंड वेलकम टू बी आई सी टॉक्स अ पॉडकास्ट बाय बैंगलोर इंटरनेशनल सेंटर ब्रिंगिंग यू कॉन्वर्जेशन दैट मूव इन फॉर्म एंड एनकरेज डिस्कॉस there was a broad idea that the 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 language of the gods became the language of the heroes which then became the language of human beings because you'll find in greek mythology and you know the gods are speaking to human beings there's a kind of interaction so the language was a kind of free willing idea which didn't uh, necessarily be uh, was not anthropocentric in in, in sense you know it, it it kind of covered all realms if you like what is a language and how do they make us who we are is an eternal question philosophers have grappled with over eras linguistic scholars seek to determine what is unique and universal about the language we use how it is acquired and the ways it changes over time they consider language as a cultural social and psychological phenomenon that stretches across the range of what is human over the past few decades we are faced with the language of the digital era that has rapidly changed the constitution of everyday interaction of human kind and steered evolution in all its aspects in this episode of bic talks journalist filmmaker and media entrepreneur sashi kumar speaks about language and its ever changing face this session is adapted from bangalore literature festival 2022 All right so why why is the subject because I I I firmly believe there's been a paradigm shift when we moved from the industrial revolution to the information revolution which is the era that we are living through now where we say the digital multimedia process is on the the caveat at the beginning is uh, we are in the midst of this you know so we don't have the benefit of hindsight of of uh, of, of distance in order to know fully or definitively how these things will pan out however there are very distinct trends and these are uh, in my opinion very paradigmatic trends and therefore uh, what i'm going to say is as much uh, it's tentative in some sense but of course underlining the the empirical evidence that's that's before us now so let's start at the very beginning you know when uh, in terms of language language has been a big problem for civilization for human beings ever since the idea first emerged and the idea emerged at the beginning of genesis of, of creation right so b- b- when when god spoke first and said let there be light when he said fiat lux uh, in latin it's let, let there be light umberto eco in his wonderful book the search for a perfect language he 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 says uh, and to summarize him he says so creation itself arose through an act of speech the the operational word is speech the spoken language right the speech and as things went along you you started giving the you know ontological kind of attachment to these words to all that you were speaking about you said light will be called day darkness will be called night and so on and so forth i mean biblical terms we are now looking at the western philosophy and we'll come a bit to the indo european part of it a little later he brings about god then brings every beast in the field and every fowl in the air as he says to adam to see what he calls them so adam is the first he has a responsibility of being the first nomothet he he has to name things you know of course it's pointed out by eco that there's he's only speaking about the the air and and the beast he's not talking about what's in the water in the oceans because the, that entire category of those who inhabit the seas are, are are exempt from this but nevertheless this is broadly the the idea and after that what really happens is man becomes kind of proud there's a kind of hubris that sets in and he thinks he can rival god and begins to build a tower towards heaven and to teach man a lesson this is the mythology at least god then creates a tower of call it makes it the tower of babel in other words he 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 sets man against man language against language and there begins our search for language the search for understanding each other and that's the beginning of the problem that we face Now, of course language as we know i mean wittgenstein famously said that the limits of our world are the limits of our language so language is very very crucial if you what you understand is really because of the language it may be an interior language it may be the spoken language it may be an explicit language it may be a mental language but without language there's no understanding of the world the limits of our world are the limits of our language and language is as we know hardwired as chomsky and other neuroscientists have pointed out into the uh, into the gene into the brain tissues of every human being so it's not something that you acquire it's there but what kind of language of course is 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 a different proposition but if you look at the evolution of language there are two broad streams i you know i need to foreground what i'm going to talk about in terms of the languaging in the digital era with this background you know to put it paradoxically and so there are two broad streams 
One is a monogenetic evolution of language and the other is a polygenetic evolution of language. As, as the terms indicate, monogenetic would indicate a kind of distinct evolution hierarchy of initially what was the first language which came about. We don't know. For instance, Jesus is supposed to have spoken Aramaic. However, the dominant biblical language is Hebrew. And then we have after Hebrew comes Greek, you know, because especially with Alexander the Great conquest, the Greek became even more powerful. And it also became colloquialized in various parts of the Alexandrian or in Alexander's empire, the Greek empire. So that, and that was called barbario. You know, that, that's the term, I mean, that's how the word bar barbarian, those who speak a different language. But it's a colloquial form of uh, Greek itself. And then you had the evolution of Latin, which became the official the kind of ecclesiastical language, if you like, the church. The hierarchy of the church used Latin, and that's how it proceeded. And in all of this, there are, of course, several, I, I mean, I'll fast forward a lot, a lot, a number of philosophers who've looked at this down the ages. Some of them have suffered for it. Some of them have been burnt at the stake because they said what was not acceptable at that time. Remember, these were times when if, if you said the earth was around, it, it was heresy. It, you know, you, you're burnt at the stake for that because the entire world then believed the earth was flat. So there were a number of people who, who suffered for that. However, there was a broad uh, idea that the, the, the language of the gods became the language of the heroes, which then became the language of human beings. Because you'll find in Greek mythology, and you know, the gods are speaking to human beings. There's a kind of interaction. So the language was a kind of freewheeling idea, which didn't uh, necessarily be, uh, was not anthropocentric in, in, in sense. You know, it, it, it kind of covered all realms, if you like. As against this, there's of course the thin strand of what you call polygenetic uh, evolution of language, which had the suspicion or had this hunch that this Eurocentric concept of uh, monogenetic language was not all, all that was in the world, that there were a number of other language systems that were simultaneously happening around us. But because the world wasn't a, an open interacting space then, one didn't know about it. And so it wasn't as if the Hebrew was the origin of everything and everything came from that. They had a, a sense that there were other languages, even in the 10th century, even in other systems. Al-Magdisi, in fact, he says there are allusions in the Quran to languages which are pre-Adamite, you know, uh, which, which precede Adam. So, so this was a, uh, it would be considered heresy in some quarters, but this nevertheless grains some kind of ground and credence. Giambattista Vico, uh, the, the influential Italian uh, philosopher, uh, laid down this, this descent that we spoke about, that, you know, that there's a hieroglyphic language, there's a symbolic language, and an epistolary language. Hi hieroglyphic language, of course, being belonging to the domain of the sacred, the symbolic being about heroic signs, the hero, the gods, the heroes, and epistolary being the language of communication of people who are separated with distance. I mean, epistle, you, you, you then have to communicate through the, in the form of an epistle and so on. So in, in all of this, what's important is, as Plato, you know, there's this whole uh, Platonic understanding of, of language as what you call the Cretilian understanding, where he says language is actually miming what's happening in the world. It actually reproduces primarily through the medium of sound what is happening in the world. So the emphasis on sound is, is the undercurrent that I'm trying to point to in, in my narrative. Just because we don't want to be Eurocentric, we come to 1786 and we come to Sir William Jones, who in his uh, The Asiatic Society of Bombay, came up with this explosive finding or, uh, or shall we say exposition that the Sanskrit language, whatever its, um, uh, shall we say, antiquity, had a wonderful structure. And to quote him, he said it was more perfect than Greek, more copious than Latin, and more exquisitely refined than either. Although it, it, had, some, it had borrowed from, uh, you know, it had semblances of both, and although they might have a common ancestor, the, the original language may be something else. It was not claiming to be the original language. But it was actually setting off a new strain called the Aryan race. And that, of course, took on mutative forms and became fairly dangerous, as we know, during the fascist period in the 1930s, much later. And we have resonances of it even today in India, particularly in the current Indian dispensation, the Aryan race and, and the language uh, implications of that racial theory. So the study of languages, uh, which, uh, which, which is called glot glotogony, for those who are interested, is, is a fascinating study. And our next um, uh, stop, if you like, a milestone, is a gentleman called Bahua. I mean, it's a French name. It's B-A-R-R-O-I-S, uh, uh, pronounced Bahua, who uh, spoke about the evolution of language being from one of illuminative understanding, one where you didn't need to speak, uh, perhaps in the biblical. I mean, in, in science fiction these days, you'll find if Martians are landing on Earth, they communicate with Earthlings through a form 
of non-spoken, non-verbal language. We understand what they're speaking. I mean, so this is actually a, an idea that was very much in the air then. Bahua spoke about that. And he said, in fact, the uh, f first language was uh, the language of action. It was exclusively gestural. It was only gestural. It was only gestural in terms of your face, in terms of your body parts and so on. And he sought to prove that even passages of the Bible, which referred to God addressing Adam, were not spoken in a verbal sense, but in a non-verbal, what you call a mimed language, mime language, okay? And in fact, the, the first time there's a clear reference, as Bahua points out, in the Bible to spoken speech is when God speaks to Noah. Before this, all references are pretty vague, and it's only in, in the, in the, in the post-the-flood, in what you call the anti-diluvian phase, that uh, phonetic language becomes common. The spoken language as we know it becomes... So, and then, of course, I'm linking this again with the, what, what, is, what in Latin is called the Confucio Ligurium, or the, the confusion of language which the Tower of Babel, uh, Babel uh, sim symbolizes. So, gestural language then was an important uh, stream. I mean, just, just to uh, you know, keep that in mind. Uh, it, it's, it's also called dacty, dactylological, dactylological language. I mean, just, that's a technical technicality. That's the use of fingers and arms in order to explain. I mean, all of us tend to do that. And today, of course, that's turned into a kind of cliche. We talk about body language when the president of the US, or you say it's not just what he speaks, but what his body communicates is as, as, as important. So experts spend a lot of time interpreting what the body language was, and sometimes the body language is in tension with the spoken language, and so on and so forth. And, and then we quickly move on. Of course, we come as we come to the 19th and 20th century, and there's a big shift in uh, you know the, the the way transport and communications develop, and so on. The idea of what's called an international auxiliary, la you know, uh, auxiliary language (IAL) develops, and this. This is a fascinating, uh, because the idea of having a universal language which all of you can speak. But in a literary festival like this, you, you're not worried if I'm speaking in Tamil or Bengali, because you speak in that particular language. And there were many such manifestations or avatars of this IAL, or International Auxiliary Language. But I'll just mention one or two, which, which were landmarks, which had some influence at the time. One was called Vola Pukt. Vola Pukt, it's a German word, Pukt with the umlaut over the U, Vola Pukt. This was in 1879 by a Catholic priest and, uh, who wanted to foster unity among people. And he idealistically concocted this language or devised this language. His name was uh, Johann Martin Schleyer. He was a German. And, and it had 28 alphabets. Its template was 28 alphabets. And for every sound, there was a letter. For every sound, there was a letter. That, 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 that was a, so again, the emphasis is on the sound. You know, how do you express sound? How do you convert sound into meaning? This was the whole uh, emphasis. Uh, keep, do keep that in mind. That, that's my undercurrent. That's my running thread. Uh, this, of course, preceded by a few others who I'm, I'm, I'm not going to mention because, and we'll skip straight to eight years later, the language that you must have heard about, it's more familiar, Esperanto develops. That's eight years after Wola Pukt, and that's developed by a doctor, uh, Ludwig uh, Zam Zamenhof. Uh, Ludwig Zamenhof, he wrote under the pseudonym Dr. Esperanto. Esperanto means hopeful, and therefore the language was named after him. And, and today we say what we need is an Esperanto language in the world so that everyone can communicate with one another. And, and the person, this Zamanov was of Jewish origin. He lived in Polish Lithuania, which then was under the Tsars, part of the Tsars empire. And what happened is some very influential people took up this language. Esperanto became very popular by, and was taken up by very powerful, influential people, including Tolstoy. And in fact, uh, uh, and, and Tolstoy's humanist pacifism was seen as uh, revolutionary at the time. So the Tsar frowned on it, uh, and this language was banned in, in, by the Tsar. So in, in the Tsar's empire as well, by the Tsar's regime. The Esperanto continued to flourish, and in fact, uh, Esperanto Association sprung up all over the world. It became fairly influential. In fact, the Bible was translated into Esperanto. Hans Christian Andersen's uh, stories were translated into Esperanto. So it, that's quite a fascinating chapter in, in the evolution of language. Again, the emphasis was on sound. 28-letter al alphabet template, and every sound had a word, had a letter. Every sound had an alphabet. And every sound, every word, every sound ended, the accent was on the last syllable. The tonic accent was on the last syllable. That was what was common to this language, Esperanto. And it only had one uh, gender, the article, definite art, la for the definite article, you know, they, there was no difference for man or woman in that. Of course, these days we say they, them, you know, we are back to that. So it's important to see how we have come full circle in some ways. Yesterday, in another session, I was listening to the 
uh, a Persian, uh, an Iranian uh, poet and uh, translator, who was saying in Persian, the, per the pronoun, personal pronoun, uh, doesn't have any gender. However, the problem of translation is when someone translates it, he, or, he makes it he or she, and what happens is all the good, all the positive gets he, and all the negative gets she, and therefore you create a gender discrimination. The translator creates, uh, you know, willy-nilly a gender discrimination. That's just by the way. But you don't have the problem now because there is becoming fairly popular now, uh, fa fa fairly accepted as well. So Esperanto became an international language and influential philosophers, including up until Eco, Umberto Eco himself thinks, Esperanto or the, uh, something like that has a future because that's a way to go in order to have a universal language because technology is uniting us. You know, industrial revolution perhaps didn't unite. It, it created the North and the South, it created divisions. But the digital revolution does unite on a plane of communication. And all of us have a smartphone. All of us are, uh, you know, uh, interacting with one another in different languages perhaps. But if the language is common, the, 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 the communication, the networking, the understanding, uh, the fellowship, etc., might be far, far greater. And how language, you see, the thing about language and technology, and, and now I'm coming to our, our, our digital phase of this, is that the essence of technology is not technological. Heidegger famously said that. For instance, take a writer like Ernst Hemingway. I mean, he, he's, no, he's known for his definitive language, for his simple words, for his, you know, very well-honed language. And he, he says at one point that how he developed this language was because as a journalist, he needed to do that. When he went to different countries to cover different occasions, whether it's the Spanish bullfighting or this or that, and had to send his report to his uh, newspaper, it was sent via the telegram, telegraphically, where every word was paid for. So he, he, he instinctively developed an economy of words, and it's not just words, the bigger words you had to pay for more. So he, not just, diff you know, less syllabic words, smaller words. So, so if you look at Ernst Hemingway, a good portion of his writing will be if you convert them into syllables, into a spoken sound, it will be monosyllabic words or, or disyllabic words. He hardly ever uses uh, five or six syllabic words. And that's what, that's what characterizes his, his brilliant writing. I mean, it's seen as definitive, great writing. So that's how the, 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 the technology becomes so, 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 so important. So in digital technology, what really happens is I think there are some paradigm shifts that have taken place. I'll quickly run through them. One is that we have moved into a, you know, the, the idea of flatism has gained ground, that moved into a flat ground. You know, it's, it's, a, it's, no, it's no longer highs and lows, flat is important. Already people were talking about it. You had, uh, you know, early intimations of this when Susan Zontag said that in the post-Nietzschean phase there are no heights or depths, there are only surface spectacles, surfaces and spectacles. Um, or when uh, Roland Barthes, for instance, he rubbishes the idea of depth having, uh, being a repository of concealed meaning. Or, or a postmodernist like Jean Baudrillard who talk about the mirror kind of uh, idiom, the mi mirror, you know, a symbol. So they were privileging breadth over height or depth. If you look at the language of the new media, look at the language of the internet, you talk about surfing the net, right? You don't talk about height, diving into depths of knowledge or ascending heights of knowledge. And the, it's, it's surfing, spanning, scanning. The jargon of the new media, the jargon of the digital new media is one of breadth, not of depth. That's very indicative. Um, and then there's the other big shift in, in terms of paradigm is a shift from the linear to the non-linear. We are used to a whole narrative sequence where I think therefore I am, that Cartesian understanding of the world, the logic, the way in which you logically perceive uh, the world and your context is suddenly disrupted. You know, disruption is a positive word in the digital, in, in the digital realm. Disruption isn't a negative thing. If you talk about digital disruption, it means you're appending long-held uh, prejudices or beliefs which, but moving into a new realm which is not necessarily inferior, which could probably be as good or perhaps even superior, which is in keeping with the new technological capabilities that that, that, that new era gives you. So, the, so instead of when you move from the linear to the non-linear, you move from a cause and effect understanding, logical understanding of the world, to a simultaneity in terms of understanding the world. Both simultaneity and instant, instantaneity. It's, it's here and now, it's now and it's it's in motion it's as in motion and in motion it's here and now the speed as well is part of it that's the characteristic of the new media you know it, it it's not something that you dwell on you contemplate you cogitate about it's here and now and it's instant and it is simultaneous so uh, vs ramachandran famously says that the human body is very fa fascinating because the brain is 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 digital in its in its capacity where the body is analog you, know, you eat you digest you eject 
Uh, but the brain can simultaneously grasp many things. Even as I'm speaking to you, I'm aware of what's happening there. I can hear, I can hear some people being restless. I can hear the breeze. I can hear some. So the human brain has a capacity. I mean, why would the television screen, for instance, have 20 uh, things happening at the same time? You know, you'll have a m main anchor. You'll have the sub, uh, you know, visuals. You'll have three bands. One is toxin commodities. One is weather. One is flash news. And if it's a Bloomberg financial screen, you'll have even more items. 18 to 19 you know, simultaneous elements. Because somebody knows that the human brain may not capture all of this all the time fully, but you can selectively keep capturing different parts of it. There's a simultaneity in which you approach. So technology is coping with the inbuilt capacity of the human brain. And that's, that's one aspect of digital. So the language will also start reflecting that, should start reflecting that is the point. It's already happened in the realm of sound, for instance. You know, we, when you digitize sound from analog to digital, what's happened is, in the initial analog sense, to, to illustrate this, when you went to a cinema in the old days, the sound came from the screen. It was very straight. But now, what you call digital surround sound, what it really means is, what was an analog sound track has been broken up into, its digital, into various tracks, components, and digitized. So when you see a, a crow flying from left to right on the screen, the speakers from left to right in the auditorium will kick in, and you will actually feel like looking up to see the crow. If a hero is being chased by a mob, you don't have to see the mob. The hero is looking back into the camera and running. From the sound of the mob, because the speakers behind kick in, you know, you, you, so it is approximating to the human sensorium of sound, the human facility of sound. So, it, you know, the, the oral capacity that we have, the 360 oral capacity. So in sound, we've already established that. It's a language. It's a technology that, that, that enables a, a language. It, it can happen in the realm of visual as well. It has, you know, it's happened in digital now. It's happening now in the digital. For a long time, we have, we have, we have uh, kind of imprisoned the visual in a rectangular frame ever since the Renaissance. I mean, wh why is it that the cinema screen, the, the television screen, the mobile screen is all rectangular? It's not coincidence because in the Renaissance, when the idea of perspective developed, people were looking out, the, out of the window and painting. So the, the window frame became the reference, and that's how this technology also picks it up. But today, that, that frame is going asunder because in the digital realm, we are talking about 360-degree uh, glasses. You know, you're, talk, you're talking about high definition. You're talking about wearables, uh, Google wearables. And right now, they have rudimentary characteristics, but they are going to develop. So in other words, the visual too will actually approximate to the human natural capacity because the human being doesn't see things in a rectangular frame, right? You have a 160, you have a panoptic vision. You have a 180-degree vision. And if you're a Saidantik who's developed yoga, you can probably see from the back of your head. But at least you have 180 degree vision. So this is what the technology is doing. It's making you see um, uh, what, what you can see. In other words, the development of multimedia language, which combines text, visual, and sound. Text, video, podcast. And the quality of immersiveness, emotive quality, is the new language. So the tyranny of the dominance and this is counterintuitive in a, in a lit festival, I guess, of the written word has been challenged, is being diluted, is already being, I think, um, um, uh, 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 to some extent being sabotaged, bro you know, uh, disrupted by the new digital technology. So what, the new, what, what form this new language will take? Is it, because in, in language, implicit was the dominance of sound. When, when you talk about, you talk about figures of speech in the written language. Why do you call it figures of speech? You don't talk about figures of writing. You talk, you talk about voice in terms of active, passive voice. Why, why do you use terminology of sound in order to characterize what you're writing? So this is the anterior. This is the more dominant practice. And in a country like India, we know the importance of the oral, of the oral tradition. For, for centuries, uh, in, in the, the, the ancient texts in India, whether in Sanskrit, for instance, were communicated orally. They were not, written, they were not even allowed to be written on. Partly, of course, for, for, for different reasons, terrible reasons, because you wanted to to be the preserve of a Brahmin, of a community, uh, or, or of a caste, in order to perpetuate the caste, the other, the, the other, other, the other caste. It happened in Sanskrit, in Pali, for instance. Again, it's oral communication, whether it's Buddhist texts or Indian texts. Uh, unlike in the West, you know, you find the dominance of the oral and communication orally, and the mnemonic cap capacity that people had, the power of memory to remember the entire text of the Rig Veda, for instance, or the audio of the Upanishads and so on, and communicate this generation after generation. So those. Uh, faculties of the visual and the spoken, which were 
subsumed by the written tyranny of the written text for several generations. And of course, which got a fill up with the Gutenberg revolution in the 15th century and the Caxton press also in the 15th century, uh, are now being retrieved. Those capacities which we lost are now being retrieved. And that, therefore, the new language will be a multimedia synergized language. And what form it will take is, it's not as if it's, your guess is as good as mine, is, I think, technologically determined as well as, uh, shall we say, humanly, I think, piloted. Uh, you know, the human genius is also piloting and, and, and moving it in particular ways. So this is the, this is, and, and the, the, the immersive quality that comes into it, I think, will have to substitute fully the, 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 the role of the metronym, of the metaphor, etc., and the written word. And how effect, efficiently do it, will it do it, how different, it may do it differently, whether it will be as good or whether it will be better, <coughs> is for us to wait and see. Because as I said, we are in the middle of this, we don't have the luxury of distance and hindsight. But this is the way it's going. But one does really feel that we are in the dawn of a new understanding, a new practice, a new functionality of language in the multimedia digital age. So that, in short, is the burden of what I wanted to communicate. Thank you. Thank you for staying on for the full conversation. If you like what we do, please share it with your friends and family. You can also leave us a review or rating on iTunes and Apple Podcasts. The crew that makes these podcasts possible is Gaurav Krishna on sound supervision and production with support from S. Saranaraj and Raghavendra Tenkaila. Artwork and design is by Chandni Venkataraman of Criss Cross Design Studio. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel on your favorite podcast platform. It can also be accessed on our website bangaloreinternationalcenter.org. Do follow us on Instagram for updates on all our programming. This is Lekha Naidu signing off on behalf of everyone at BIC.